regarding Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I am your moderator this afternoon. My name is Sandra Caravel, the Director of Programs for the League of United Latin American Citizens, also known as LULAC. We are the largest and oldest Latino civil rights grassroots organization in the United States and Puerto Rico. We are passionate volunteers, staff, and partners working through a nationwide network of grassroots councils to help improve opportunities and address the critical needs of 52 million Latinos nationwide. One of the most pressing issues affecting Latinos is health. Disparities in access, quality of service, and the burden of preventable chronic illnesses are rampant. Through our Latinos Living Healthy Initiative, LULAC raises awareness in the Latino community about the steps individuals must take to prevent serious illnesses by connecting Latinos with national, state, and local resources. Health outcomes will improve as long as we continue to make a concerted effort at all levels for sustained change through education and awareness, honest dialogue, and through action. As part of the National Minority Health Month, we will highlight the importance of reducing health disparities among uh, Latinos who are disadvantaged by their social or economic status, geographic location, or environment. Today, we have some great guests joining us for an in-depth conversation about obesity in the Latino community. We will learn about the causes and treatments op options available, barriers that people with obesity face when trying to face when trying to access these treatment options, policy levers impacting obesity care, and the impact of community organizations providing education and training assistance to aid in treatment. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker to provide opening remarks, Dr. Antonia Novello, who was the 14th Surgeon General of the United States under President George Bush in 1990. Dr. Novello became the first and first woman and the first Hispanic ever to hold this position. As Dr. Novello, um, as Surgeon General, Dr. Novello advised the public on health matters such as smoking, uh, AIDS, diet and nutrition, environmental health hazards, and the importance of immunization and disease prevention. More recently, during the COVID-19 pandemic, she has become the spokesperson and public health advocate for the prevention efforts regarding the COVID-19 virus. Currently, she is involved with VOSES, a nonprofit organization that partners with the National Guard of Puerto Rico to aid in testing for COVID-19 and vaccinating the elderly for influenza in Puerto Rico. Today, she continues her work developing and strengthening ties as a, trust, as a trusted mentor and creative agent of new initiatives in different sectors arising from the current need for access to health and education. Please help me welcome Dr. Antonia Novello. Lulac, thank you so very much for the invitation. Every time that you call, it's almost a true responsibility to get involved in whatever the topic is. There are so many issues in the Hispanic community that we need to address. It seems to me that the time is now. We have waited so much time and so many of our people are impacted by consequences of diseases that we do not know. No one tells us about it. And just by watching the internet or just making sure that you get into the cell phone you really don't have the true information that you can only get from real data and people that know what they're doing. So when we're talking about obesity, I'm extremely concerned because the obesity in the Hispanic community has triplicated since 1975. And when I look into this, we have to remember that obesity basically is a multifactorial condition, really fat deposition that needs perpetual care, perpetual treatment and perpetual follow-up. And what is the biggest issue? The biggest issue that, that we have in this United States of America, 1,900,000 people with obesity, with overweight, and 650 million people with obesity, of which 44% are Latinos and 78% women of minority origin, specifically Mexican-American. It also attacks our youth. We have 28% of our males, and we have about 23% of our women, and the elderly is that also free of getting obesity consequences. The biggest problem we have is that obesity has not ever been taught to us that it's a chronic disease for which we have to be extremely careful. And for that reason, in the absence of knowing exactly what is it, how in the world we can do something about it. And for that reason, the comorbidities that come with the disease 
are sometimes not known to us. And when we go to the doctor, we are already with the ex with the disease, sometimes a little bit too late to do something about it. Among them, hypertension, among them, colonic cancer, among them, cardiovascular problems, kidney disease, low back pain, osteoarthritis of your knees and your back. And you sometimes have no idea how in the world this, this hit you because no one ever told you. And what are some of the reasons that they say? They say, well, geography has a lot to do with obesity in the Hispanics. Gender has something to do. Ethnicity has to do and the place that you work. Obviously, if we would have not known that from the beginning, we would be able to watch whatever is happening there. So what happens? We are in the system in where we have truly poor knowledge of who we are because of our socioeconomic status. We have still only 18% of us with healthcare delivery. And when we finally get to see a doctor, we have only less than five minutes to be able to tell the symptom. And then there has no way by which we can explain what are my needs because culture for the doctor today is not as important as for us. And in obesity, culture plays an extremely important part because for the Hispanic community, food is equal to love. And there's no way by which I can leave my plate empty of big, large portions because it shows that my mother and my parents care for me. So my culture really is impinging on my obesity. And every single Latino baby that is skinny is not pretty, happens very chubby, and then he or she is very beautiful. So when I look into the culture, the place I live, my gender, mostly women, mostly people with little education, people without health insurance, people with socioeconomic difficulties. So what happens? We go to the doctor and he or she tells us, why don't you exercise? How can I exercise when in the community I live, maybe it's dangerous enough that I cannot go out. How can I exercise when my socioeconomic status is so low that I cannot pay the premium to go into a great place to do it in the evening, my supervision? How can I eat the food that I need to lose weight when I don't have the money to buy the healthy food that you're telling me about? And how in the world can I be able to have the information that I need from you when you only give me five minutes is in your language without understanding the needs of my culture in solving this issue. So when you look into this, I have comorbidities that really are with me most of my life. And sometimes I don't even know what to do about it. So what happens? My self-esteem hurts and I get depressed. On top of that, some of the medications that I take every day of my life, I atrogenically increase my weight and no one ever told me that. And on top of that, basically I have this sabotage of my friends my peers and the media that makes me believe that maybe the body that I have is not the most perfect one that no one tells me how to help myself. But there are consequences of this where you're employed. It's really interesting that when I look into industry, they offer me lifestyle. Maybe 6% of the companies will do what? At least 68% of the industry gives me something that I can think of eating and exercise. 13% might give me treatment medical treatment in pills, and at least 58% makes me bariatric surgery available. It's really interesting that the medications are basically today available, no one tells me about it, even though I might be eligible. Could it be that they assume that I cannot afford it? Or could it be that they believe that I wouldn't even know what they're talking about? So when you look into the offers, bariatric lifestyle changes, and medications, I don't think we really have offered the opportunity that everybody does as well. So when I look into this and I happen to be obese or I happen to be overweight, which is the most bothersome one, the over, overweight and the obese means that I have a, a BMI of at least between 40 and 45. When I have that, I am extremely absent to work. I take at least eight more days in my work to be absent during the year. And as a woman, I do eight. As a man, I do eight. I have 64% of us have accidents at work. But the thing that is more interesting is we have a lot of claims, a lot of claims in our job regarding something that has to do with our workplace. And we also have short-term disabilities. But what really, really worries me tremendously with obesity that no one ever talks to me is I lose productivity of my life and the company where I work loses productivity to at the cost of maybe $72 billion a year. And when I look into the health care that is paid in the United States for my obesity, it could be as much as $92 billion. But in spite of the cost, my life is shortened because of my obesity. And in that sense, I lose about four years of my life when I have a BMI of at least 35. I lose about nine years of my life when I have between 40 and 45. And when I am over 45 BMI, 
I can lose as much as 13 years of my life. There are consequences of being obese. So I do believe that the time has come to get me the right education. The television and the internet are not only your friends. Look for a place where there's a doctor that explains it to you as a human being with the humility of understanding that you do not know my culture and you do not know what moves me. But if you pay attention to me, absolutely, I will follow your directives. But realize that my social economy sometimes holds me back of doing what you make me do as the best for me to lose weight. Make sure that every single accessible treatment, every single accessible drug, is there for me to have, even though I cannot afford it. So I think CMS and all the private and all the other insurance in the United States has to start looking at what is feasible for the Hispanics to lose the weight. Because after all, it seems to me that we have waited so long. When I was Surgeon General, I did the Hispanic Agenda in 1991. To this day, I still don't know what they have done into this, but the minimum we can do is get into clinical trials. Because if we get in clinical trials, people will absolutely know what is good for us and what is not so much working for us. In the absence of that, we're just one more person doing one test to be able to do something for a pharmaceutical to then sell their product. Clinical trials participation, participation is crucial. Belonging to us, insurance that covers your treatment and your medication. And more than anything, knowing the reality of the medications, remembering that once you drop taking your medication, chances of having the weight that you lost that we're so proud of will absolutely come back. So for this, I say, be alert. Stop just looking at the internet and the television. Make sure that you do something a little bit more for your family by making sure that when they ask for smaller portions, you don't feel that they love you less. And more than anything, make sure that you do not just follow the body image of those ones that have no way and means of knowing what hard it is for you to keep the body that God gave you and the one that might be with you for the longest run. So the time has come to really push political trial, our politicians, the insurers of America, to make sure that 18.6% of people are not forgotten in getting their health and that health disadvantages are applied also to us as are to other minorities in this country. So the time is now to make our, vo our voices be heard. We have wasted too much time and too many of us are in dire necessity of getting the better life than they deserve. Because after all, we are members of this United States and we are members of the race that really moves the conservatives in this country and the religion in this country. We're not invisible. The time has come for people to listen to us. And for that, I urge you to get the problem of obesity under control because after all, and I'm sorry to say that people do not vote. We will select one day who will tell us exactly where we're going, but we cannot do that if we're sick and if we are in any kind of morbid capacity of not using our mind, our body to be able to be healthy. So I'm sorry to give you so many details, but I think it's important that if we do not know that this is a chronic disease, I have offered you all the things that might be feasible for you to learn so that from your seat today, you move forward to get your family going, to get treatment, medication, better housing, better food, and more than anything, the people that basically care for you, doctors that truly listen and understand your plea, even if they might not understand your language. So I wish you the best, and I thank Lulac for having given me this opportunity to make this something of importance. And I know that with the experts that will follow me, you will be able to solve most of the issues, discuss most of the agenda, and come with a plan that it may be useful for our future. So I wish you the best. Thank you so much for your words, Dr. Novello. And I thank you really setting the tone for the conversation that we'll be having. Uh, next up, I would like to introduce LULAC's Chief Executive Officer, Cindy Benavides, who's joining us for a few words uh, to talk about the work that LULAC has done, not only on the awareness front, but also on the policy front to close gaps in accessibility and provide quality of health quality um, to, to be received by communities nationwide. Cindy has devoted her career to public service, ensuring that countless people, women, immigrants have the same opportunities that she has had. She is a fierce advocate regarding health issues that stem from her own personal experiences and believes that healthcare is a human right for all. Please help me welcome Cindy Benavides. Sandra, muchísimas gracias and thank you. Dr. Novello for your inspiring words. Thank you for your service as Surgeon General and for continuing to advocate for all of our communities to Dr. Correa, Dr. Seggers, and our own Art Mota as our National Policy Director and Sandra, 
who is our national programs director. Thank you for all that you do and for being with us today. You know, I, I couldn't agree more with Dr. Novello. And, you know, what we see at LULAC as the oldest and largest national Latino civil rights organization in the country is absolutely inequities and disparities in health. And it must first start with acknowledging that these inequities and disparities exist. And, you know, today we have a big blow uh, when it comes to equal access, particularly to our Puerto Rican community, uh, directly from a Supreme Court decision that was actually decided today. And so as we think of how more, what more can we do, we know that that road is long and that there's so much more that as advocates we will be doing to ensure that our voices are uplifted. You know, I wanna uh, highlight a couple of the statistics, some that were highlighted by Dr. Novello, but I think they are worth repeating. Among them, among Hispanic American women, 78.8 point eight percent are overweight or obese as compared to 64 percent of non-Hispanic white women from 2013 to 2016 Hispanic children were 1.8 times more likely to be obese as compared to non-Hispanic white children and we know that people who are overweight are more likely to suffer from high blood pressure high levels of blood fat diabetes and LDL cholesterol all risk factors for heart disease and stroke. As the first Latina to lead LULAC as the National Chief Executive Officer, I am so proud of the work that our councils are doing across the country, our LULAC members who are volunteers, the heart of our organization, working and living in local communities across 41 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. Please know that we are dedicated to health equity among the Latino community. In fact, it's in our mission. That is why we launched our Latinos Living Healthy initiative to discuss the health issues that impact our community, including tobacco use, obesity, and lack of representation in clinical research. LULAC's plan is to address the health inequalities by providing multiple touch points and layers to impact our Latino community through educational resources, hands-on training, bilingual guidance, and webinars and programming. Our programs focus on improving health outcomes through engaging our local councils and national partners in campaigns dedicated to raising awareness and inspiring healthy lifestyle changes in, in our community for the long term. And we must acknowledge that our Latino community is not uh, a one community with a one, six, one size fits all solution. We know that a community, a Latino Puerto Rican community in the Bronx is very different from a Cuban American in Miami, from a New Mexican Latino American uh, who may be in Albuquerque. And we know that we must do more to ensure that we understand those root causes that are impacting our community. So what is our plan as we look at this specific issue? It's focused on education, outreach, and advocacy. When it comes to education, LULAC's going to continue targeting our Latino community and providing that basic overview and facts regarding health, obesity, and just overall health. This is achieved by making sure that the information is culturally relevant and translated as well as transcreated to resonate with our targeted audiences. You know, here we have to acknowledge that it's not only English and Spanish, but that within the Latino community, we also have indigenous language that is a barrier to access for so many, especially farm workers across various states in our community. We typically use radio, TV, PSAs, print media, social media stories, curated toolkits, and comprehensive communication strategies to make sure that we're reaching our community. But we know that word of mouth, and this is where our LULAC members and our councils do a heavy lift, word of mouth is what really sometimes can be the difference. When it comes to outreach, we, re we have outreach programs in communities with limited access to resources to promote healthy lifestyles. We're so proud to be able to partner across the country on different awareness campaigns, educational we webinars, and we want to make sure that we're equipping our Latino community with plans that become actions to change their lifestyle for the long term and for the better.
We do traditional grassroots methods like canvassing at events, holding community events and health fairs and services that offer a myriad of services. And we know from the Ferias de Salud that our community will travel across states for hours and wait for long hours to be able to get services on site at some of our ferias. You know, I can't help but remember our last Feria de Salud, which was in Dallas, Texas, in partnership with Alliance for Progress, where we had families coming from various neighboring states, traveling more than 20 hours to be able to receive these free services. Some of them stood in line since three in the morning just to be able to access services. And so as I think of our community, I want us to be motivated by understanding that we have a lot of work to do. And as advocates, we must continue to raise our voices, which leads to our advocacy. We support efforts to address the health challenges associated with obesity and to offer patients the resources and the support they need to maintain a healthy weight. We're working to help recognize obesity as a disease, to raise awareness and to increase treatment opportunities and options. We support the policy changes and legislation to open insurance coverage to a full continuum of obesity care for patients, including passage of the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act and related patient advocacy work. We know that we must absolutely be proactive and that's why we have different programming around nutrition and health because we know that if our families have the correct information and have access, we will be able to make the right choices, not only for ourselves, but also for our families and community. And I couldn't agree more with Dr. Novello when she talked about the challenges and the barriers. The truth is, that many Latinos across the country are underinsured or uninsured. So many do not go to the doctor because they simply cannot afford to do so. And so I can tell you that as LULAC, as a 93 years young civil rights organization, we're going to continue championing our community, continue advocating and raising our voices and continuing pressuring at all levels local, state, and federal to make sure that we find solutions that address inequities and equalities when it comes to access to health and prevention and care treatment as well. With that, Sandra, thank you again to all of our experts, panelists, Dr. Novello, and our own team for all the work that you do. Gracias. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that insight, Cindy, and really for setting the tone on this important conversation that we're having today and for all that you do and Dr. Novello do, does for her respective community. Obesity is a chronic disease caused by a combination of genetic, biological, and, and environmental factors. According to the CDC, 45% of Latino adults live with ob obesity, the second highest when compared to any other ethnic or racial minority groups. Among Hispanic women, almost 79% are considered overweight or obese. It is important for us to get some insight into the understanding why rates are so high among the Latino community. Furthermore, we also want to shed light on community organizations like LULAC, NHMA, and NON and their work and why it's so important in fighting this epidemic through advocacy and education and training. I'm thrilled to, join, to, to introduce our panelists today for some amazing guests who will be engaging in this very important conversation by providing their expertise to learn more about what contributes to this disease and steps to stay involved in advocating for your community and care. Now to our panelists. Today, we're joined by Art Mota, LULAC National Director of Policy based out of Washington, DC. Mr. Mota drives the strategic policy agenda and advocates initiatives to achieve LULAC's policy goals at the local, state, and federal level. Art brings over a decade of substantial congressional and Capitol Hill experience to LULAC, where his work also included substantial agricultural, health, and nutritional issues. Thank you so much for joining us today, Art. We're also joined by Dr. Carly Zeggers today from the University of Kansas. Dr. Zeggers is an assistant professor at the University of Kansas School of Nursing and an emergency department nurse practitioner at University Health Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri. 
Dr. Zegers' research includes health literacy and policy in underserved populations with a goal to improve community-based health communication through strategic planning and implementation strategies. Thank you so much for joining us. And last but not least, we're also joined by Dr. Ricardo Correa, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Arizona, who also serves as the Program Director for Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism Fellowship Program. His research focuses on neuroendocrinology and healthcare disparities among the Latinx population. He has dedicated his professional career to help underserved communities by establishing a community clinic, clinic in the Phoenix area and by mentoring underrepresented minorities to become part of the medical field. Thank you all so much for joining us. I know that we have talked a little bit from the policy end up to the awareness end, and there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding obesity. And my first question is for Dr. Correa to really just explain what is obesity and what are some of the common causes? Um. Gracias, Sandra. Thank you so much for, for, for the invitation. Uh, and it's a real pleasure. Thank you to Lulac uh, uh, for, 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 for this amazing invitation. Uh, and really hearing Dr. Novello, a, a lot of the things that she mentioned, it's, 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 it's so important for our Latino community. So let's start first. Uh, 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 I think, that Sandra, you mentioned that obesity, yes, is a complex chronic disease that is produced because of the excessive or, of, or abnormal accumulate uh, fat tissue in the body. And it results in multiple uh, other conditions, including hypertension, it was mentioned, diabetes, heart disease, osteoarthritis, obstructive sleep apnea, liver disease, and even certain cancers that we are aware of. So the term obesity has been being used for, for many, many years. And then uh, approximately in 2017, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology tried to introduce a new term to decrease the stigma that the term obesity have created. So the terms that they introduced was is called ABCD, adipose-based chronic disease. And uh, it's because obesity is not about weight itself. It's, uh, it's a health threat that causes multiple other effects that is yes, some, a component of the weight, but ABCD is more than that. It's a science uh, of disease to the, this and this is the size, the term obesity. So as we look into this complex uh, uh, world of this disease, we have to think, we have to take into account there are multiple misconceptions that, uh, and stigma that happen and myths uh, one of them is that uh, uh, it's just because you're eating bad is because it's happened. And we know that ABCD or, or the new term for, for obesity that a, a American Association of Clinical Endocrinology is, plan, is, is proposing is a component of multiple things. It's genetics, it's food environment, it's social determinants of health, it's sedentary life, it's um, underlying medical conditions. Besides that, we determine at this point that when we take we think about overweight and obesity, we measure a single item that is called body mass index. And that is a wrong measure of what we are thinking about. So body mass index more than 25 is overweight, more than 30 is, is obese. But let's see that we are just measuring that and we are classifying people according to that. What happened with an athlete that have a lot of muscle or mass and no fatty tissue? The VMI will be elevated, but that person has no consequences of obesity because the person has not the excessive accumulation of fat distribution. What happened with a person that is a little bit thin would have an excessive accumulation of fatty tissue in the belly? Probably the VMI will not be more than 25 or 30, in, in case of obesity, more than 30, but that person is facing the consequences and complication of obesity. So using BMI to classify this chronic and complex condition probably is not the best way. There are other ways to do it, but at least what I wanted to mention about what is obesity is that we have to understand it's a complex condition with multifactorial uh, aspect, including environmental, including climate change that is affecting our Latinx community exponentially more than others. 
And then this will translate at the, at the end on, on obesity. Something that I want to uh, close with is systemic discrimination or systemic racism cause stressful uh, situations in the person that raise cortisol. And at the end, these patients are more prone to have some kind of uh, obese disturbance or, or obesity. So even this societal determinant of health, systemic racism is component of why underrepresented minorities, including Latinx especially, have more predisposed. And it's not just a genetic component or something that is a, a biological part. Oh, thank you for that. That is some very important information for us that there are different factors that contribute to this. Um, my next question is for Dr. Zeggers. What are some of the bar barriers that people with obesity face when trying to access treatment options? Uh, great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think it, just like the chronic disease itself, this is also an incredibly complex question in terms of access. Um, when you think about barriers for access, uh, part of it is the community. I really like to talk about that. Uh, the, uh, the idea of community for this chronic disease is, is central. So there's always the idea of cost, right? So we're going to break this down. So cost is always an issue in terms of having adequate uh, coverage for medical insurance, having access to medications and these treatments are often costly. We also have to think about cost of food it's very difficult to find those healthy foods that would associate with kind of uh, addressing some of those uh, needs and glycemic control and all these other elements to improve how we are eating and our relationship with food. It's expensive. And looking at the rate right now of where food prices are going, we really need to start addressing some of these things. So that's cost. That's one barrier. Um, I think additionally is uh, when I think of as a nurse and, and coming at from a nursing standpoint is communicating and, and talking to people about it. Weight is a sensitive topic, especially for women and in our community, there's stigma related to it. Uh, weight and what is healthy and what is healthy weight. And as Dr. Carrera just mentioned is weight might not also be related just to health, right? So it's also about the movement and, and doing the right things to to avoid this adipose tissue disease, um, any of those outcomes. So talking past that stigma and communicating with each other, communicating with our families and making it a community conversation is a big element. So um, I, I, I speak from experience knowing that weight was a problem and people wouldn't even talk to me about it. I remember like saying, oh, you know, I'm trying to work out and I, and, and hearing back from my family, you look fine. It's fine. You're okay. And it's like, no, that's not the point. Like I, I'm not saying I don't look good. I know I look good, but I'm not healthy in talking in terms of health and what the consequences of not addressing this health is for our loved ones and for our family and um, really conveying that. So that's a, definitely a barrier in terms of accessing these. And then the last one I want to bring up is this idea of uh, barriers. And, and I hope to talk about this more is, is talking to individuals to get the resources for this. There are a, a multitude of resources that we have as healthcare providers and health workers to get some of these um, lifestyle choices, but also changes under control and, and medica medication and, and surgical options and, and what we can do as a medical team to try to get uh, these this obesity disease for individuals in relation to what they can do and what's going to fit and over time what that looks like, but we have to start talking about it. And so bringing it up and talking to your providers, talking to your family about it, going and making an appointment. So I always talk about primary care providers. I Having an established primary care provider from you early on, so you have that baseline conversation, making just an appointment to talk about your weight and not taking in 10 or 12 different to topics. As Dr. Carrera just mentioned, it's a complex conversation. You can't just go in and add it on to the back of like, yes, here's my annual visit, my annual pap smear that I need to do. And we need to talk about all these things. Oh, and let's talk about weight. Like, no, let's, let's bring up 
this, this chronic disease at the forefront so that we are talking about it as a primary concern. So bringing that forward, and you can do that as a patient, and I empower you to really go in saying, nope, this is the topic I want to talk about today. That's what I would recommend in terms of barriers. Absolutely. Thank you for that information. And it's so important to have these open and honest conversations with your medical professionals. Um, not every person is, is built the same, right? And it's very important for us to be able to go ahead and find the correct kind of treatment for individuals. Um, back to you, Dr. Correa, what are some of the treatment options that are available to those that are living with obesity? Yeah, um, and I, I want to echo that part of Dr. Serger, that is uh, you, um, the health is your, is from you. So you are in power for having anything that you want for your health. So I feel that sometimes patients always leave the health to the provider and it's not that way. The health is my health and I should be empowered to, to make my own decisions. And if I want to ask a question, I should be asking questions. Something that uh, before, sorry, I continue answering the question. So it's uh, something that I feel many of my patients when I was working in Rhode Island, um, they were Hispanic patients and many of them were coming to the doctor for three, four, five years. They didn't understand the language. So when, I came, when they came to me, they were like, oh, and I was telling them, you have diabetes. Oh, I have diabetes. Yes, you have been taking a medication for three, four years of diabetes. And they're like, oh, I didn't know. And I said like, why you are coming to the doctor? It's like, yeah, you know, they speak English. I speak Spanish. I didn't understand. I just was following the recommendation. That should not be the patient attitude. The patient attitude should be, okay, I don't understand. Let figure a translator, figure something that where I can understand what I have. So going back to your question about the um, uh, what are the treatments that exist with obesity? So I think that very important in, in this chronic complex condition is to have a multifactorial uh, help. One is the social help. Social help is very, very important treating this, this condition. So you have to have the social support from your community, from your family, from the people that you are close with to have success on this. The first management that we usually utilize is uh, a diet and exercise. It's not an easy um, way to do it, but a uh, healthy lifestyle, eating healthy, doesn't mean eating less, but eating healthy helps a lot in decreasing the complications. That is the end point really of this disease. It's not really the disease. It's not how you look. It's not the weight. It's what is that weight causing in your body? The inflammation that is causing a constant inflammation. Imagine if you have the COVID 365 days, 24 hours a day. That's what obesity is. It's just inflam inflammation constantly that is damaging a lot of your organs. The next step that we have is medical management of obesity. And we have a very good amount of four or five drugs that have been approved by the FDA for medical management of obesity. One of the latest one has been able to reduce up to 15% of your body fat mass. So very good medication. The downside of this all of this medication is the cost. And Dr. Seger was mentioning this, that the cost in our community is important. So if you have a very good insurance, you will be able to access this fully medications that I'm talking to you about. But if you don't have that insurance that you are underinsured and uninsured, then those the medication become a dream. It's, it's not a reality because you cannot access them. So so that, 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 that point is very important. And here, I think LULAC and other organizations are advocating so our patients can access these medications. We think about only 13 or 14 states approve Medicaid, Medicaid approve those medications. So we are talking about that a lot of states do not let the patients access to this kind of, of, of medication. So that's something in work. And the third, uh, 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 mechanism of, of treating this disease is surgery. And there is different kind of surgery, but the intent of all of the surgeries is to reduce the weight, uh, to control all the hormonal issues that happen with that fatty tissue, and then uh, to, to, to make the reduce your weight, and then you keep your weight at that, at that point. So then um, 
uh, you, you can have the benefit of not having the inflammation, constant inflammation. Finally, I want to say that think about that adipose tissue, that fatty cell, it's an endocrine organ. And every time that you want to kill that cell, that cells will find a way to survive. And what is the way that they use? They use a lot of hormones secreting to your brain, telling your brain that you're hungry, that you have your uh, you 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 are hunger. So telling all of that kind of things, and then making less successful all the effort that you have doing. So that's why when we talk about treatment, it's a combination of healthy lifestyle, social support, uh, community support, medication and or surgery. So it's, it's, it's a combination. We can talk more about that, but th thank you so much for that, for that question. Yeah, that's some really insightful information. And I know we've talked a little bit more about treatments. We've talked about barriers. Now, when you make your appointment to speak with your doctor, healthcare providers might not always feel comfortable discussing obesity care. Um, Dr. Zegers, can you uh, share a little bit of insight of how to bring up uh, the conversation and advocate for yourself uh, in regards to having these important conversations with your primary care physician to find the right type of treatment for you? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. I'm, I think this is kind of a baseline thing and, and it, it's past the conversation of obesity, right? It's, it's about you as a person and how to navigate our healthcare system, which we can all say is probably not working always the best for us. It's not usually, we have to fight the system a lot. So part of one of the things that I love to recommend is to, what is your ideal state? What do you want to be as a person? You want to be healthy. You want to have mental health. You want to have physical health and, and live, right? And what's your quality of life? So sitting down and really thinking about those goals, that is your why. Why are you going to the doctor, right? Like, why are you going to see this care provider? And at the end of the day, that is what you are going in for. So when you're going in for these health providers, bringing up this conversation, it's because you want these X, Y, Z things. I want to be, I want to grow up to be a strong mother so that I can run around with my children and I can be with them and I can show them eating habits and I can go on uh, long walks with my kids, right? That, that's my why. So if you walk in with a strong why, typically that's a goal setting strategy that you can work with the provider because then they understand what you want. Because walking in, and saying, I want X, Y, Z treatment, that, that's not necessarily always, it doesn't make sense, right? Because the, then you have somebody on the other side saying like, what do you mean this treatment? Why do you want that treatment? So walking in with your why and what your goals are in your life is a great strategy than to give that healthcare provider an opportunity to talk about what they know for resources and the things that they can do and let them do their job, right? So you get to do your job as a patient and living and wonderful and like having this goal in your life and let your provider do their job to provide care. And you can bring ideas and you can bring examples that you've talked to others about and doing your uh, research, but stand up for yourself and say, I don't feel like you're helping me get to my why or you're getting to my goal. How are these things focused? So that's one strategy that I always like to bring up so that you can tell and share your story with your provider. It gives them room to help you too. Secondly, making sure that you're advocating for yourself and not saying, not stopping until, until you really get that comfort level with your provider. So if you are unhappy with what they're saying or kind of blowing it off, or if you're not happy how they brought something up, um, I actually struggled with obesity for most of my life. And I would have providers just kind of say, I'd be like, what about my weight? And they're like, uh, we could probably address that if you want. And it's like, yeah, I want to. That's why I brought it up. So make sure that you kind of keep pushing it. Like if you're concerned about it, bring it up. And um, it, it's kind of a sensitive topic, it, but it's something that we have to start talking about and talking within our um, families. I also really like to say to be prepared for your for your visits. We all know that healthcare visits are so tightly, like the time is tight. And so again, making your appointment just for this conversation, but coming in prepared, coming in with goals. And 
I would really like to, you know, echo what Dr. Carrero is saying. This isn't just about the weight, but what is your goal physically, right? Like, what do you want to do? Where is your health look at? What, like, are there, are there other things that you want to control? Do you want to get your diabetes to where you're not taking insulin, but taking a pill only, or even off medications? Is that a possibility? So having some of these goal conversations, um, and then if you need to have an advocate with you. I, I think that we need to really push forward and have somebody there to advocate. And if you're not getting the answers you need or they're not making sense, using your community health workers, using the promotoras in your community, using your family members who are healthcare trained and have that language, have them have your back and have them in there and, and really have those concerns addressed right? Because this is your healthcare. And I cannot echo that enough about what Dr. Ferreira said. It is your healthcare. It is up to you because they have maybe 500 patients. And as much as they, I know they do care because I know I care as a provider. It's hard to, it's, it's your life 999% of the time, right? Like, so my 15 minutes or 20 minutes that I get to see you, I can only do so much, but you have the rest of your life to handle this too. So how can we exchange information for you to be the most successful version of you. I hope that thank answered you. your question, Sandra. <laughs> Absolutely, no, thank you. And again, health is wealth, I think is, is uh, the saying that we absolutely um, share with our communities. And I know we've been able to hear uh, from medical the medical side, um, I want to bring art into the conversation to really um, connect the dots, right? Um, the, the policy levers that take place, uh, whether it's at a, a local, state, or federal level, um, they come back and they impact us, whether you're a provider, whether you're a patient. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about um, some of the policy levers that are impacting obesity care specifically for the Latino community. Art, uh, can you provide uh, some background information on that for our guests? Yes, uh, thank you, Sandra, for that. You know, and when you talk about the policy levers, you know, it's important to understand that they are the tools that government and you know its agencies have at their disposal to not only direct but manage and also shape changes in public services and offerings that they have for our public community. Um, and this can include laws and regulations, either at the federal, state, and local level, uh, but also government goals and strategic plans and different framework policy uh, that the government has in partnership with local communities uh, and community organizations. Uh, so the goal here, of course, is to reduce, uh, reduce the risk of obesity in our populations, predominantly Hispanic and Latino uh, communities. Um, we know that obesity is a major public health concern uh, because we know that two thirds of adults and one third of children are overweight or obese. So of course, many factors contribute to this, but it's important to understand, of course, that um, the CDC classifies obesity using a body mass index or BMI. Uh, in adults, that's anyone with a BMI over 30. Uh, so knowing how that's factored in, how that's calculated, you know, knowing how, how do I find out my BMI, uh, knowing it's a ratio of weight divided by height, um, and you know, not only of, as Dr. Correa was alluding to earlier, not only a, a ratio of body fat directly on our on our bodies. Uh, you know, myself, I guess I'm defined as obese myself. If you had to measure my height with my weight, and many of us would fit in that same category. Uh, but when it comes to the policy levers, again, you know, many of these are recommendations that we've heard of to address uh, you know these concerns. Um, some of these can include, um, you know, state and local plans to improve the quality of access to food in schools, uh, programs that address exercise and eating habits of not only parents, but children, um, and many school-based intensive physical education classes, even though for the last couple of years, many of us have been going to school from home. So we have not had access to the proper exercise and eating habits that we would typically have. Uh, so we have to turn to social support. Uh, looking at the space that we have for physical activity, you know, in our community settings. Uh, but some of the policy levers that we have seen in action, of course, are when it comes to fresh fruit and vegetable programs. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen partnership of the USDA and other uh, state and local food organizations that provide, you know, healthy, nutritious food to our citizens. Uh, some of these have been in place and have been amplified during the pandemic, of course. Um, and we've seen interventions to improve nutrition, 
and fitness and youth across our country too. Um, you know, and there's also some uh, federal agencies that are doing proactive work that we need to share more of the work that they're, they are doing with, with our members on this call, but also across the country. Uh, you know, the CDC has a separate uh, office devoted specifically to this. They have a division of nutrition, physical activity, and obesity, uh, because it is a concern. And they, of course, lead the, uh, our country's efforts to prevent chronic diseases like obesity uh, by promoting good nutrition, regular active physical activity, and a healthy weight. Uh, so they work, um, you know, we work in places where people live, learn, and, and play. Uh, another uh, example of a policy lever that we've seen is reach, racial and ethnic approaches to community health. You know, there are a national program administered by the CDC to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities. Uh, so they reach uh, and carry out local culturally appropriate uh, programs to address, you know, a wide range of issues among the Hispanic and Latino community. Uh, and of course, the federal government you know, provides funds to various states to carry out these efforts closer to home. And that's where more of our focus is on the policy and advocacy front. But uh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much for providing that insight. I know we've talked um, solutions. We've talked about um, conversations that you should have with your medical professional and the policy levers. And, you know, I really want to talk a little bit more about the gap in, in terms of accessibility. Art, can you please um, speak on the policy work that LULAC is doing to support policy changes and legislation to open insurance coverage to a full continuum uh, of obesity care for patients? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, at LULAC, we support efforts to address the health challenges that are associated with obesity. And we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we're able to share with our members and our community uh, you know, the resources and the support that they need to maintain a healthy weight. Uh, so, you know, we are working to help recognize obesity as a disease and raise awareness to increase opportunities to resolve that. Uh, so, we support, as you were saying, policy changes and legislation that will open and increase insurance coverage uh, for patients. This is through legislation, but also through advocacy work with our partners. Uh, we are a part of several coalitions. We are sharing the word like we are in, on this call right now. Uh, you know, we have um, the Obesity Action Coalition, the Stop Obesity Alliance, and the National Minority Quality Forum. Uh, and just now recently to help amplify this message even more, you know, there's a Health Equity Coalition on Chronic Diseases. Uh, which really combines uh, some of the work uh, advancing health equity among, among communities of color with chronic diseases. Uh, but uh, some of that is also advocating for um, expansion of current programs like Medicare to include obesity care and treatment, treatment that may include access to specific medication that we don't have access to currently through uh, current regulations, like anti-obesity medications, which are currently excluded from Medicare Part D coverage. Um, and following le legislation on Capitol Hill that we can advocate for and help promote making sure our members of Congress and our senators are actively uh, supporting uh, these initiatives that will support people back home. Uh, one prominent bill is the uh, Treat, Reduce, Treat and Reduce Obesity uh, Act, which will again expand Medicare to cover um, obesity treatment options, options that are evidence-based, uh, and we have to ensure that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are able to expand Medicare Part D coverage to include FDA approved anti-obesity medications that will help individuals. Another uh, option would be to expand you know, the intensive behavioral therapy uh, benefit that would help individuals uh, qualify uh, to see certain providers and have access to specific services to ensure that those are covered by Medicare. Uh, these are the uh, disparities that we see, the gaps in, healthcare access and quality of care for Latinos that we can uh, do to make sure that we have access to those. So again, thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much for that, Art, and thank you to our panelists for the in insightful conversation. I know we have a couple of minutes left, and I, I did see that we had a couple of questions that came in through the chat. Um, Dr. Correa, Dr. Zegers, um, what type of training are health providers receiving to, to be open and responsive to patients, clients advocating for their health? Um, what are some of the uh, system changes that are underway to support 
uh, the time required to have some of these important conversations was one of the questions that came through the chat. I get started and, and I can start and end the secretary's good year. So several things. So in the for the new generation of uh, uh, of physicians or so medical students that are right now uh, in training, there is a systematic change that has been happening in the entire nation where they are teaching social determinant of health as part of the core curriculum of medical schools. This will make that when this new generation graduate and start practicing, this will be immersed in everything that they do. So in their conversation with their patients that probably our generation and older generation didn't have that, uh, uh, we didn't have that, that core knowledge. So, so that I think that at the level of a medical education, that's been very positive. The thing that we are still missing is at the level of the systems and the healthcare systems, because as Dr. Seger mentioned and Art mentioned, having 15 to 20 minutes with a patient and trying to address everything that you need to address, not just the medical part. Medical part sometimes is short, but all the social component of that medical part is not enough. So we, I think that we should effort our policies and and everything, and as a community of patients, we should make all the effort to make this change, to let away the issue of health insurance and pharmaceuticals dictating what we should do. We, as a community of patients and providers, we are the ones that knows what is happening, and we should dictate what we should do. So expanding that 15 to 20 minutes that we have to more, and having a clear conversation on that time. It's not the quantity, but it's the quality of time that you have in front of, 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 of your patient and the patient in front of the provider. I think that it is something that needs a lot more work. Um, uh, probably there's some initiative, but I have not seen any of them getting into uh, in becoming a reality. So I think that the work that we have right now as a community, as uh, providers, as patients, and as organizations as LULACs, the National Hispanic Medical Association, Latina Strong, that is another of the organization. All of that is to fight a good fight against the system and trying to tell them that our community needs special things and that 15 to 20 minutes is not enough for our community. And we understand because if you think about if your provider does not speak Spanish, just this translation part, will make it at 15 minutes. So we need more time and we still need that to continue the fight. I will I'll definitely add on to that. Um, different models, I, I know that there's been a big push for increasing uh, diversity in both medicine, nursing, and across the board um, for culturally congruent care. I think that will help a lot. Um, and there's different models being taught. I think some institutions are really taking this to heart and um, increasing the diversity and communication training available to their providers, uh, not enough, right? Uh, one thing I would like to do uh, to recommend too is that we continue to take on the challenge of focusing on team-based care. Coming from the Hispanic Nurses Association, uh, the beautiful thing about a nurse is we don't bill for our time, right? So we're not time bound often. Um, so really using that team and, and using the team for those big conversations and, and encouraging um, other providers and physicians and practitioners to bring in the whole team, bring in our new, uh, nutritional experts and dietitians, bringing in our physical therapists to try to figure out how do we get people moving, knowing that there's physical limitations? How do we tap into our pharmacy friends and our pharmacists who are in the, they know some of these things and can we use some of their expertise for some of those social factors that we're talking about. Um, one thing that I, I really like, would love to see too, is this push for our providers decentralizing from the hospital system back out into the community as well and really talking to the community. Uh, I think our, so, our respective associations are all doing that in a lot of ways, and that's where some of this grassroots effort is going to probably take place more than some of the policy. It's more of a bottom-up kind of uh, where we're in the grocery stores advocating for healthier foods. We're in, in talking to 
um, restaurants and having a specialized menu. Like I, I would love to see a, a, you know, a Hispanic Medical Association and Hispanic Nurses Association approved menu at some of our family restaurants in our communities or some of those efforts that are grassroots. Um, I think we could do a better job at. And, and I think we have the potential there that might not be at the system level quite yet. So that's that's where my um, our, my uh, attitude towards that is. And, and I agree with Dr. Pereira. We, our nursing uh, profession is really looking at what diversity is and really what co conversation means and, and putting time into what that means and how to, how to be respectful and bringing in culture of humility more than just competency. So. Thank you for that. And I know we are up. Uh, our hour has whizzed by. I know that this was such a wonderful conversation. Again, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that you were able to learn that obesity is in fact a chronic disease and that can be a lifelong battle. Uh, this is why LULAC is also calling on comprehensive policies surrounding obesity care, social determinants of health and policy barriers to obesity care access exasperate the deep impact of the disease within the Latino community. A special thank you to Dr. Antonia Novello, Dr. Correa, Dr. Zegers, Cindy Benavides, Art Mota for joining us today for this important conversation. And a huge thank you to our partners at Novo Nordis and HMA, NAN, for the wonderful chat this afternoon. If you'd like to if you'd like more information on resources, please visit lulac.org slash obesity to download resources in both English and Spanish. Again, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we'll see you next for our next Cafecito Charla soon. Thank you. <laughs>